So, hi everybody, I'm Paul Bockelman, town manager. I'm calling this first meeting of the budget coordinating group to order. Um, this is uh, January 27th at 8.30 a.m. Pursuant to chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021, this meeting will be conducted via remote means. Members of the public who wish to access the meeting may do so via Zoom or by telephone. Uh, the instructions are included on the agenda that was posted. No in-person attendance of members of the public is permitted, but every effort will be made to ensure that the public can adequately access the proceedings in real time via technological means. This meeting is being recorded. What we will do is um, verify who's in the room and if they can hear and can be heard. So I'll just go through my screen. Uh, Sean Mangano. Yes. Uh, Lynn Griesmer. Present. Uh, Doug Slaughter. Yes, I can be heard. Andy Steinberg. Present. Allison McDonald. Present. Sonia. Yes. Eldridge. Austin. Present. Mandy Joe. Present. Uh, Peter. Present. Mike. Present. Sharon. Present. And Bob. Present. Thank you all for being here. Uh, if you want to show the agenda, Sean. So the first order of business, and then hopefully my role will be finished, is to select a chair, and then the chair will uh, will conduct a um, vice chair uh, selection. So are there any nominees? And the way we will do this is we will ask for nominations and uh, then see if that person accepts. And then if there's, and we will continue that process until there are no more nominations. And then we will go around the room and vote for the chair. So are there any nominations for chair? I nominate Lynn Griesmer. Okay, Andy, uh, Lynn, do you accept the nomination? Assuming we won't meet too often, yes. Okay. Are there other nominations for chair? Well, okay. So given that, um, I will go around the room with the members and ask for if you approve of Lynn Griesmer being the chair. So I'll talk with, start, well, I'll talk with, start with uh, Andy. Yes. Uh, Allison. Yes. Uh, Austin. Yes. Mandy Joe. Yes. Peter. Yes. And Bob. Yes. And Lynn. Yes. Okay. So you are the chair of the BCG, which may this, <laughs> We may have one other meeting, but hopefully this is your, your sole role. So I turn the dais over to you. Okay, I'm, the floor is open for um, nominations for vice chair. I'll also take volunteers. Hold on. Oh, um, volunteer. Allison, is that you? <laughs> are, are there any other volunteers? Then I'm going to quickly go through the uh, voting uh, for Allison for vice chair. Lynn Griesmer is an aye. Andy Steinberg. Aye. Mandy Johanneke. Aye. Austin Surratt. Aye. Bob Pam. Aye. Allison McDonald. Aye. Peter Demling. Aye. Okay. Then. Um, we're going to start with a fiscal update. Am I correct on that, Sean? And I know you probably sent us that, but would you send me the agenda? Yes. Thank you. Do you want me to go ahead and share my screen now and start going through it? Sure. Okay. Yes. So, so there was a, an email sent out last night from Yeah, Sean. the agenda was a part of that. Um, I will find night. it right now. Yep. Just go on, Sean. Okay. All right, so we're going to look at updated projections that include the governor's, uh, the information from the governor's budget. And I'll just go through and highlight mostly what has changed from the last time uh, we presented this at the financial indicators um, meeting. So in local receipts, one thing that did change that's outside of the governor's budget, but it, it has an impact is PVTA. We received the um, FY21 PVTA letter. Thank you, Doug. And our um, assessment went up quite a bit. It went up about 10%. 
Um, most of the increase is actually, so the way our PBTA assessment works is we pay a portion, um, we pay the whole thing, but then we get reimbursed by UMass, five colleges, and then we pay a residual portion out of our transportation fund. And they break it down for us based on the routes of um, who, who owes what. And so in this particular case, our assessment, our assessment from them went up quite a bit, um, but it was almost exclusively UMass, um, their share that went up. And I think the way they described it to me is that a lot of people's routes sort of scaled back where UMass had to maintain a lot of their routes um, last year, especially during the second half of the year. Um, and so that's why their costs went up quite a bit. So you'll see an increase in our um, revenues, which is shown here in special assessments. That's the, you'll see that's quite a bit of an uptick from the previous year. Um, but you'll also see down below in our state assessments, that's where the, the cost going out is shown. So for local receipts, I think that's the, the only major change from last time. Uh, and state aid, we saw chapter 70 go up um, very small amount. I think Doug, correct me if I'm wrong, I think it was $30 per pupil, which is you know, almost as low as they ever do. I think the lowest they ever do is maybe $25. So we're hoping to see that number get better. Um, again, Amherst and Regent only get minimum aid for chapter 70. We don't ever get any foundation aid or any of the benefits from all the things that you hear on TV about all the new money going into schools um, because of the, the wealth level of town and the other factors. We only get the minimum aid every year. So that's really the most important number for us when, you're, when we're advocating is what that minimum number is. Charter um, reimbursement went up. Um, I'll let Doug speak to whether there was a, an enrollment increase. It did look like the governor put quite a bit of more money into charter reimbursement, and that may be part of it as well. Unrestricted government aid went up 2.7%. Uh, we knew that a couple days ago. We were hoping for more. Um, you know, the governor technically is uh, keeping to his promises around increasing local aid the same as uh, whatever the consensus revenue forecast is for the state. Um, but, you know, there was a year where the consensus revenue forecast was zero, and I think they had, had a 20% increase or a 15% increase or something so way above what that, that was. Um, so, you know, I know Paul and many others are advocating for much more than what that was this year, and that would make a big, a big impact on our financial picture. Uh, veterans benefits went up a little bit. Um, these are the ones sort of just fluctuate a little bit up and down. State-owned land, it's another one that's very frustrating to us. Um, our value of our state-owned land went up, but not more than what other towns' state-owned land percentages went up. Um, so ours actually goes down relative um, to the pot of money that's available. Um, and this is what we get from the state for, you know, the land that's owned by, you, you know, mostly UMass, I think, for us. Um, and this is another area where we're advocating really for a formula change or, or something significant to happen here because towns like Hadley bring in um, you know, as much or more in state-owned land revenue as we do and we have the flagship campus for the, for the state. Uh, so it really doesn't make a whole lot of sense. And I got a really long description of how this program got to be where it was from somebody at the DOR last week, but um, yeah, it just doesn't seem like a fair formula the way they do it. And then the last two things here, school choice and public libraries, those um, that revenue comes in, but then it goes out because we give it to the schools, the school choice tuition revenue. So that goes, um, we have to receive it because it's on our cherry sheet, but then it, it gets put into the school's account. Um, and then public libraries, Sonia, correct me if I'm wrong, but same thing, it goes to the, to the library. And then the last piece here on the revenue, sorry, on the revenue side are other financing sources. So ambulance fund, um, Sonia and I have been looking at the activity in that fund. Um, it dipped way down during the pandemic. There were a bunch of, there's been some pretty significant changes to the fund. We lost the Hadley routes, um, which decreased revenue quite a bit. That was a, a big chunk of the activity. Uh, but then to try to offset some of that loss, fees were increased, um, or the, the billing fees that uh, come out of the ambulance department or ambulance to our, our uh, third party biller. And, and then the pandemic hit. So we never really saw the true impact of losing Hadley and then what the, the, the increase in revenues would be from the fees going up. Um, so we're still not really, it's, it's hard to separate what's related to the pandemic, what's related to our fee increases, what's related to losing Hadley. Um, but what we, we have been looking at the activity um, through the first six months of this year 
And the way this fund works is we have to have the money in the fund. Sonia will be proud of me for saying this. You have to have the money in the fund before you can appropriate it um, for the following year's budget. So, so we're looking at this and we feel pretty good about this number. Um, CPA is just the debt. So it comes in and goes out. That doesn't really have any impact. Um, enterprise funds continue to be an area that we're concerned about. Um, you can't really tell looking at these three years, but if you go back prior to FY, um, prior to FY 20, our reimbursements from enterprise funds were much higher. Um, so that's an area we look, we hope improves as we come out of the pandemic. Um, and then another adjustment you'll see here that just is throw, makes things look a little strange is that in FY 20, Two, you'll see this is FY22 recap now. So this is what um, Sonia has submitted to the state as what we think our revenues are gonna be. And it also includes the um, free cash transfers that we made. Um, the council approved transferring so much free cash to the stabilization fund. And so it, it shows up here. Um, so if you take that number out, you kind of get back to where we were during the financial indicators report, but because we have to include that number because it's part of the recap, it makes it look like our budget's dropping, but um, it's really not in, a, in, in reality. Okay, should we pause here and take questions? Sure. <clears throat> Any questions? Okay, seeing none, then let's go on to um, oh, Allison's got a question. I'm sorry. Yeah, Allison, go ahead. Just real quick. Sean, could you restate that last bit that you were saying about it? The budget looks like it's going down, but it isn't. Can you? Yeah. So if you go back to the financial indicators report um, presentation that we gave in November, that was before the recap was finalized. And so this number here in free cash, this 5.9 million, that wasn't in there. Um, that, that's a number that comes in as part of the recap. And it's really just a transfer. It's not a true revenue source coming into the budget, but it's something we that has to be part of the recap. Um, and so if you take this number out, we were somewhere around 86 million. Um, if you go back to that presentation and and that's really sort of the true budget. Again, this is because the recap is in here. It makes it, it throws it off a little bit. Andy, you have a question? Yeah, I was just curious about the uh, charter reimbursement and how that compares to the charter assessment for uh, the act on the other side of the coin? Um, so I can pull, um, after I stop sharing this, I can pull up the, uh, the cherry sheet so you can see both um, if you wanna have that pretty okay. handy. Let, let me ask Peter if he has a question before you do that, okay? Peter? Yeah, it doesn't have to be now, Sean, but it, could you just give me the the, the 101 version of, of what a, a recap is? Um, it's just the first time I've seen this term in town budgeting. And sure. Sonia, why don't you admit my ignorance the, in terms of what, exactly what that means? Yeah, Sonia's the expert. She's been doing it for the last, um, I don't want to guess how many years. Too long. Yeah. Too long. It's the, it's, um, the form we set our tax rate with. So when we um, vote our operating budgets, those are set in stone once the council votes those budget, but um, revenues are in flux until our tax rate is set and we have to balance. So once I submit the tax rate, those revenues are now in stone as well. It doesn't mean we can't take in more or we won't get less. It just means those are the numbers that are tied to our budget at this point. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions on this sheet before we take it down? Then let's go back to go to that next sheet or that other sheet you were talking about. For um, charter? Yeah, around charter, right. Sure. Can you, is this super small on your screen? It is. <laughs> uh, let me see if I can make this. Especially for this hour of the morning. Doug, I might have to rely on your your former IT skills. How do I zoom in on the Sorry. screen and make it? Control plus. Control plus. I knew it was something easy like that. There we go. There we go. Thanks. All right. So this is the. All right. So this is the estimated receipt side for charter. Um, so there's the reimbursement going from 107, 841 in this column here to 236. 
And then on the assessment side, um, our charter is going up from 1.6 million to 1.8 million. And again, I don't know if Doug, you may, you may not have uh, dove into the numbers yet. I know these will go up if, if our charter enrollment stays the same year to year, these numbers will still go up somewhere between three to 5% because um, the tuition rate goes up. Um, so every kid will cost you know, three to 5% more um, and when you're talking about millions, it adds up pretty quick or, you know, 1.5 million or so. I see Mike's got his hand up. It just on, on that note, the projections show basically the same number of charter students as we have this year as next year, actually in both districts, but I know this is reflecting the Amherst district, but at the regional level too, um, I think it's within the range of one kid difference. Um, so essentially flat. So I, I think, it just, I think it's just important to note that the increases you're talking about are based on the inflationary factors, not on more kids going to charter. And Mike, I don't know what you think or Doug, but it, it just seems like the charter schools have sort of hit their hit their enrollment numbers in terms of growth. It doesn't seem like they're growing as much as they were in the past. So now it seems like it's more shifting between towns sending there, but um, it doesn't seem like we've had those big, you know, 10 kid increases per year like we did when the when the PBCICS was expanding. Yeah, my, my sense is they are actually are continuing to fill seats and PBCICS continuing to increase without the expansion. They hadn't met their cap. Mm -hmm. um, but I think, you know, for positive reasons, the district's been able to kind of stabilize those numbers and yeah. PBC, you know, for the, the school in South Hadley as well, um, you know, that we, we're seeing a stable enrollment. We're not seeing kind of big trends either way. So um, my understanding is they, they are taking more classes at certain grade levels, but they don't okay. seem to be taking as significantly more kids from our community. If that's that makes good. Sense. No, that's really good. Peter. Sure. Uh, so yeah, um, two quick points on that as it relates to budget planning for this year and future. So th there, there is a pending lawsuit for the PVC ICS is suing the state to expand. Um, so that, that is probably the biggest variable that could affect Amherst Elementary Charter in the future. Um, there's a 9% cap, right, on, on what we can uh, lose to, to charter, and we're at about 6%-ish. So, you know, that 1.8 could go up another, you know, X hundred thousands of dollars. Um, the other thing to, to note about, so Mike is correct that we're, we're starting to stabilize in, in the enrollment, and who knows, you know, what that happens in the future. But the way that relates to the charter reimbursement is the reimbursement is only for a portion of, of the change in enrollment from year to year. So if, you know, once you get into steady state enrollment numbers, your reimbursement will, will, will trend to zero. Um, and it's, it's, it's true that the, that the initial pot for the reimbursement amount um, to fill that line item for the governor is, is higher than normal, as, as Sean mentioned a few minutes ago. Um, but that number for us, if our enrollment stabilizes, will we'll, we'll pretty much go down to nothing uh, over time. I, th I assume you mean when you say go down to nothing, you mean no increases. So you're right. So the, since the reimbursement is for the change from one year to the next year, if your yeah. enrollment stays the same, then eventually you're not going to get reimbursed for, for anything. Got it. Thank you. Are there any other questions about this or the previous chart? Okay, seeing none. Um, then we're going to go on to budget updates and we're going to start with the schools, then go to the library and then to the town. Oh, I'm sorry. There is we one other item. Do we, we know expenditures, right? Yeah. yeah. Do we know do anything it. about health insurance? Um, so health insurance, we have the bands, unless Paul has gotten some inside information this morning, which cross my fingers he does. Um, but we our bands for health insurance where if we were at the, the minimum and it would be a 0% increase. If we're at the average, it would be a 3.7% increase. And if we were at the max, it would be a 7.5% increase. Um, you know, we don't wanna to speculate too much, but when we've looked at our numbers, um, or at least the last time I saw the numbers, there was nothing that indicated we would be at the max, for example. Um, the numbers seem to be um, trending where, you know, PPO, HMO, you know, have some differences in their experience, but on the average, we seem to be in an okay place. Um, so we're crossing our fingers that we're below the average, but um, again, we don't wanna to speculate too much. Paul, did you any have any whispers this morning? 
no, but they, they understand that we are very anxious on it and it might be wise, I think, for Sean to go through this side of the budget as well. Um, okay, yeah. go ahead, and, Sean. And just for all everyone here to know too, we've, we've taken a number of measures to try to get our health insurance rates as, uh, down as low as we can. We've taken advantage of um, some different programs that Maya offers that then produces discounts on our overall rate. Um, and so we've implemented a number of those the last couple of years. Uh, so yes. Yeah, yeah, go this, ahead. So this is the expense side. So um, operating budgets haven't changed um, in terms of what we're we're looking at. So we've got the two and a half percent for everybody, and then additional funding for the town to help fund the implementation of the Crest program, and then the adjustment for charter and choice tuition boosts up the elementary schools to uh, two point seven three percent. The debt section hasn't changed much. That will continue to fluctuate. Um, as we dive into the capital plan and meet with JCPC. Um, but this is still the, 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 the main thing here is that we're proposing 10% of the tax levy uh, for capital. And this will, this section I'll just say will change, um, this will change quite a bit before the final version. One of the, the big um, variables here is when we borrow for the library, uh, we have the library project moving forward. We can choose to borrow this year, which would make our first debt payment in FY23, or we can borrow uh, in the future, which would push the first debt payment out a little bit. Um, and there's pros and cons to both. Um, but if we do decide to borrow this year and try to take advantage of low interest rates, that would put the first, first debt payment into FY23. So again, the overall won't change in terms of the 10% for the levy, but um, you know how much is for projected debt and current debt and, and what's left over for cash capital will, will probably change or will definitely change. Uh, in the miscellaneous section, um, we have a retire our pension assessment. Again, this is pension for uh, both the elementary schools, the town, the library. Um, there is piece uh, uh, parts that are related to the enterprise funds get carved out and, and paid by the enterprise funds since they're supposed to be self-sustaining so that so it's the net after the enterprise fund uh, pension costs are backed out. We have OPEB back to 500,000, which is sort of the, the, the ongoing level. We'd like to keep increasing that into the future. It was really what our original plan was, was to increase $100,000 per year until we got to um, our annual required contribution. But we want to at least keep it at 500,000 and make those um, ongoing contributions. Then reserve for abatements and exemptions. That's always just 1% of our, our levy. We might see that go up a little bit. We did send a flyer out this year to um, make people more aware of uh, the exemptions uh, opportunities available to them. Um, but generally the 1% of the levy is, is enough for what we need. State assessments going up 10%. Um, again, that's related to charter tuition going up and PBTA going up. Those are the two big drivers that drove this up and then we have some increased revenues to offset. Um, these cherry sheet offsets are just the, uh, they equal the, the money that we give to the schools for choice and the money we give to the, the library. Um, so that just nets out. Um, and so the, the bottom line is right now, I think this is a, um, you know, a balanced budget that we could move forward with. Um, there's gonna be some variables that change up and down, but we're, um, we're in a balanced place at this point. Um, Sean, I, so I have my hand up to ask a question. Um, on the debt ass assessment, does that include the two items that will come before the council on my, uh, the 7th, which is the increase for the fire um, pumper? And the second one is moving forward with the OPM and um, the architect for the schools, for the elementary school. So it doesn't include those because we're proposing um, to use free cash to pay for the increases of that. So that will take some burden off of the debt and um, and you know any future override, it'll take a little bit of pressure off of that um, because we're proposing free cash. The But the pumper, the original pumper obligation, the 450,000 that the council approved, that is part of um, our projections here. Okay, and then does this include any change based on numbers that were presented at the last four towns meeting for regional debt? 
No, because the regional debt didn't change. And, and Doug, again, correct me if I'm wrong. It, it doesn't look like it changes for FY23. It's when you get past mm -hmm. and some of those out years right. um, when our roof and the, the fields potentially kick in. Um, that's where those increases start to come in. Are there other questions with regard to this budget? Okay. So are we ready to go on to the next? I'm not seeing any objections. So this is the budget updates. And I know we have a four towns meeting on the um, 10th, I guess it is, 8th, 10th. Um, and uh, also, but we're talking about both elementary and secondary here. Mike, and Doug. Yep. Um, so I will take it. Doug may jump in. Sean has encouraged me to be brief and to set a good uh, dynamic for that. Uh, I'm not sure I'll be successful, but I'll do my best. But there's no visuals, at least. So um, so I really just want to talk about five things. Uh, I will mention, as Lynn said, both Amherst and Region. When I'm not being explicit, assume that it applies to both districts. When I am being explicit, I think it'll be more clear. So I just want to start that we have a lot of challenges running school in a pandemic, right? Any newspaper you have will describe the challenges um, and they're, they're ubiquitous, right? It's not like site specific, but we've got students who struggled given the social emotional toll of the pandemic, not just the safety measures that we have in place, but the challenges that existed, uh, that exist with families being you know, greatly affected uh, in all sorts of ways by COVID restrictions and, and COVID itself uh, and the illness. Soon academics, we definitely, like most districts, saw a significant gap in achievement levels uh, based on the separate from in school, not in school, just the nature of last year, you know, starting in March 2020. And uh, we saw those exacerbated in ways that include race, gender, um, socioeconomics, and disability. And so we're working our hardest to both support students' social emotional well being, but also ensure that they have successful options as they leave. So, you know, I, I know we're talking finances, but this all connects. So I promise, again, this section will be brief. Otherwise, Sean will send me um, darts, and I don't want that. And the last challenge we have, like every organization right now, is staffing. Um, you know, we went through the fall. We have an online uh, tracker of all of our COVID cases in our schools. It's updated every day. And what you'd see is in the month of January, we've far surpassed um, any uh, number of cases that we've had the entire pandemic up until now. Uh, and so we've kept our schools open. We've uh, virtually never had to do the sort of warehousing of students like, oh, go to the cafeteria and you know, hang out and do some work because we, we don't have teachers for you, but that has a cost to it, right? That had, uh, you know, we thought ahead, we have permanent substitute teachers. Our staff have been incredible about being flexible and covering for one another. Uh, but there's a real cost. And there's a cost when we say, don't come in if you're feeling sick. Our teachers are the folks who are so dedicated, and I'm sure the same is true at the library in the town, who, yeah, I've got a sniffle, I'm fine. And, and now we're saying, well, if you had to for a couple of days, we're really not fine, don't come. Uh, but we have to pay people for, you know, they're certainly entitled to sick time, we want them to take it, and we have to pay people to cover for them. So there's some real financial implications of all three of those. I'm incredibly proud of the level of quality of education we've offered this year, despite the pandemic. Uh, I mentioned, you know, that we've, we've covered classes and health and safety measures have been part of that as well. So, you know, just getting uh, emails and pings from newspapers around, you know, what kind of masks do we supply for staff? And we've recently transitioned to supplying a high quality mask for students. We always had surgical masks available, but higher quality masks with Omicron. And, you know, we have used some grant funds for that, but there's, it's been a primary focus of, of schools this year. So then connecting it to the fiscal challenges and the unknowns, right? Health insurance was recently talked about, so we're eager to get that number. Uh, one of our challenges, we're in a competitive environment. So when we are not providing the, the services and options that families to request, it means that they have options to go to other schools. It also means that we have to attract students and, and attract students back. So for instance, in the last couple of years, we've added Chinese and, and that's worked out to be worked out well fiscally, but it didn't at first, right? So we were hearing from folks in our community, we want to come back from middle school or high school, but we we want there to be a robust Chinese program. Uh, we're continuing to hear that maybe even needs to be more robust. And, you know, we're struggling with the financial implications of that. So all that to say we're in a competitive environment, the same is true of the performing arts as well, uh, where, um, you know, we have to have additional factors that we didn't 
used to have to think about uh, in terms of retaining students, but the financial implications of charter schools are so great that um, it, 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 it does affect our thinking and it affects our finances. Um, if, we're, if we're not meeting the needs of our students, students are gonna find a place, other place to go and that has a pretty big sticker shock. And so our desire to stay competitive affects our fiscal challenges. Uh, this year, we have a, a fiscal challenge with our bus contract. Our bus contract, like most bus contracts, uh, operates off an inflation factor. Uh, inflation, as you know, is at higher levels than it's been at in recent history. And so it means we're gonna have to pay more for our busing. You know, we, we've done very well with that uh, over the past five years where inflation was incredibly low. And now we're on the other end of that. So our, um, it's not because we have a new bus contract, but the inflation factor is gonna push up the cost significantly there. Um, I think as, as Sean mentioned before, so the governor's budget had $30 per pupil, uh, which really doesn't move the needle in terms of our budget in terms of year to year costs. And that pushes it off onto municipalities. Uh, we do have a fiscal challenge as it relates to, and I'll speak, this is an elementary issue, Wildwood and Fort River, uh, because we had to close up the quads for airflow and safety and ventilation. It means we lost 12 classrooms at each site. It means that classrooms are taking place in cafeterias, which have been converted, art rooms, music rooms. And the, the cafeteria is particularly important to note because it means we can't use it for students to eat. Students are eating in their classrooms which means we need more staffing to cover lunch periods. Um, and I know this sounds like a, a small detail, but it's not a small budget amount that we're having to cover with staff overages uh, to make sure that staff have their duty-free lunch, which they're contractually obligated to, and that student, students eat in a supervised environment. Our cafeterias, the elementary level generally, you know, on average would host four to six classes at a time with one person supervising, and we don't have that option now. Um, so we've had to increase staffing to support students because of the nature and the infrastructure in our school buildings right now. And the last one uh, is our ESSER funds. We continue, you know, we have gotten three rounds of ESSER funds, which are from the federal government related to their stimulus package funds related to the pandemic. We've tried to be very thoughtful in how we approach the use of them uh, and try not to build bridges that there's nothing on the other side of as much as possible, knowing that it's a multi-year grant. I know my professional organization has recently written to the federal government to advocate, and there were other co-signers, to extend the use of those funds. They're slated to end in September 24 to push them out two more years so that we can wean off them a little more gradually. I'm highly supportive of that, but at this point, it's, um, it's that, that's the timeline that we have right now. So now I'll just make uh, just a couple of AMR specific comments, a couple of region specific comments, and, and Sean hasn't kicked me off. I haven't gotten the hook yet, so I think uh, I'll try to be try to be done soon, Sean. Uh, but on Amherst, uh, you know, we're involved in a building project, which is townwide. I want to thank Kathy Shane, and I'll do that at every opportunity for being chairing that project. She's doing a fabulous job. And uh, in addition to the sustainability, like the green sustainability of use of energy, we'll have operational savings when that project comes into place in significant, in significant waves. So I know that's 2026, but we are trying to build a bridge to when we will be more efficient. Right now in our three buildings, we are very inefficient and it causes financial as well as operational challenges for us uh, on multiple fronts. Um, also, we are slated based on votes of the Amher School Committee and the Regional School Committee to move sixth grade to the middle school, um, not for this fall, but for the following fall. Uh, I will do my one little deviation. I got to spend time in every sixth grade classroom in Amherst in the last two weeks asking the sixth graders what they wanted to think about what middle school should look like for sixth grades. It was awesome. They have a lot of great ideas and a lot of things for us as a community to think about because they're not just about the school. It's really what does the community look at? Uh, as it thinks to a sixth grade, sixth, eighth grade middle school. And how do we position young adolescents in our larger community? The conversation went a number of different ways I wouldn't think, and it's something I'm looking forward to sharing with the Amber School Committee and the larger community in a week and a half. Um, but there will be some you know, challenges and savings along the way, but really when both those projects take place, when sixth grades at the elementary, at the middle school level and the building project uh, is in place, we're working with one less school and a whole lot more efficient staffing models uh, operational models. And so we really, it's for me, it's often how do we get to 2026, where we can realize significantly more savings than our current current setup designed. I know, in the past, we've looked at regionalization, you know, that would have had a, a lot of uh, savings didn't end up going forward. We looked at regionalization actually twice, one with Pelham mm -hmm. at the elementary level, one K to 12, you know, the communities were not in support of those measures. Um, we've looked at uh, combining schools. We've looked at a whole variety of things over the last five years, and we've settled on these two as providing the operational savings. They're, they're occurring, uh, they're not synchronized, and they're occurring less quickly than we'd like, 
Um, a former building project also would have netted significant operational savings, um, but now we're back in that queue. So, you know, it was really trying to get to a bridge where our infrastructure can support a much more efficient model of schooling for our students. At the regional level, we we're presenting our initial budget on Tuesday. We had a four town meeting. Uh, we received uh, feedback from our member towns. They didn't align, uh, which is no surprise and no new news, right? That towns were looking for different assessment methods and preferring different things. We also heard from our school committee at the regional level that they were comfortable with adjustments based on uh, enrollment, but they requested a budget with no cuts uh, and looking at sustainable funding sources. So we're trying to take all that in. Uh, that pie doesn't all add up at the moment, but Doug and I are working really hard to how to come up with a model that uh, meets the competing demands and interests to the to extent possible. And so we're looking forward to that four town meeting that uh, Lynn mentioned, which is in the evening. So it's a little shock for those of you who've been to a number of four town meetings. It's in the evening on Thursday the 10th. It supported that Amherst Town Council, I believe, has a retreat on the 12th, which would have been the logical date we would have had it. So Lynn, thank you for letting me know. So we didn't just let that conflict happen. Um, it's really helpful to have that communication. And the last thing uh, I want to share is that, you know, just we, we see a drop in enrollment starting in our current fourth grade. We, the census would predict that trend will continue. Uh, so we have realized some savings at the elementary level. It's hard to realize it now because of our infrastructure, but we will. But that, that, that will drop will occur when those students get to the middle school and high school. Uh, that'll affect the assessment for the member town because you're, we see a pretty significant drop. Uh, starting in that current fourth grade, it also will make other efficiencies more realizable in the future. So, you know, we are looking at the long view on this, not just the year to year, but how do we get more sustainable over time? And I think our enrollment will help us. Uh, we've made some changes before. We've moved Summit Academy to the high school and eliminated use of that building. Um, sorry, I'm going to have overhead. This is a good time to stop because you can't hear me anyway, but I'm happy to answer any questions folks have. Um. I'm going to take questions. Can I just have one clarification? Just my memory is clogged. Absolutely. Is the middle school moving to the sixth grade in 2020, fall of 22 or fall of 23? Fall of 23. Thank you. Yeah. So it's not the next year, next academic year, it's the year after. Got it. Um, are there questions? First of all, Mike, thank you for that very concise, Doug, I think you did a good job. Please make sure you tell him that. Um, that uh, it was very uh, putting it all together. I do have one other question and then Andy, I saw your hand. So why don't you go ahead? Yeah, it's just, uh, you mentioned about uh, enrollment trends in the elementary school. And um, I was curious whether the um, there's any way to project whether the enrollment of the number of students who are in special education, there's projections there or that's an unknown number? No, we do have some of that projections. Uh, we are seeing an increasing share of special education students when you look at our preschool level, because all students with special needs uh, in the community, you know, get assessed by our preschool coordinator. Um, we are seeing students with significant needs uh, in our preschool environment. So uh, I don't see a downward trend that way. Um, there's some thinking about what it meant for a generation of students to miss a significant amount of time in preschool and the implications that has. Um, I'm not an early childhood expert, but I've heard early childhood experts talk about the implications in the pandemic at different age spans playing out differently, not better or worse, just differently. We talk about adolescence and kind of what that does there, but as it relates to, to early learners, uh, who weren't able to get early intervention for long periods of time, um, there is some thinking that that uh, will have a negative effect uh, on those students and, and will kind of, uh, by effect, uh, increase the special education load, particularly at primary grade levels over the next few years. Andy Joe. Yeah, thank you. Um, you talked about the staffing challenges in a pandemic year and all, and as we move out of sort of pandemic as pandemic and move into endemic situations is what I would say. Um, do you foresee those staffing challenges lessening um, in terms of if testing decreases and quarantine and isolation decrease um, such that it would affect the budget? I know it's affected the budget this year for a number of reasons, but do you see that lessening to the point where that may decrease 
or put less stress on the sort of subline on the budgets in the coming years? Yeah, it's a great, great question. So at Foot River and Wildwood, you know, the, the, at the elementary level, that's really based on, at this point, more the infrastructure of the schools and the challenges. But um, when the sixth grade moves, that'll ease. So we have one more year of that. I think more generally, um, your guess is as good as mine where the pandemic goes. Both of us probably read a lot of the same articles, Mandy Joe, and, and you know, you could look at the optimistic scenarios. You could look at people like Bob Washler out at UCFF who, who you know, recently wrote pretty, and he's pretty moderate. I find him, his opinions often moderated uh, compared to others. And he just said, I, I think this is gonna be like the weather, right? When the weather's good, things are gonna be all right. But the weather is going to be more variance. There's going to be, you know, it'll be seasonal component to this. Uh, we, you know, he was uh, interestingly arguing for, uh, you know, really he was using weather as an analogy to say uh, you have to adjust your measures consistently, like you adjust your what you wear consistently based on that. And in places in the Northeast, he was predicting spring, summer, early fall looking pretty good. And with a seasonal respiratory illness that's significantly more significant than many others, that we may be in similar places through winters over the next few years. So it's hard to, it's hard to know, it's hard to budget for, to your larger point. Um, and I think that's true across departments that uh, we're, uh, I mean, by not my departments, but I think the training would be true for Sharon and Scott and Tim that, you know, we're all anxious to get back to more predictable levels uh, of that and not yet ready to counter eggs or, I don't know, I'm terrible expressions, but you know what I mean. Um, Sorry, my wife tells me I should never do that at meetings and she's right. Um, but, um, but I, you know, so I think, I think it'll be better, right? I think we, we have vaccines, we didn't have them a year ago. Uh, we know a lot more now than we knew then, but even the question of like masking, which has been the, the, the uh, social media cause this week about masking in schools, right? You know, it, it's hard to know exactly how that'll play out over time. What we know is what we've done has been pretty effective at reducing and eliminating spread in schools. And um, I think as it relates to staffing and what the quarantine rules are and what the spread is, it's just, it's hard to plan for, you know? Um, and uh, I'd love to be an uh, internal optimist. I typically am on this one. I've learned uh, one of the, my lessons of the pandemic is don't always come out with your optimism in a public meeting. And I'm gonna choose not to right now. Um, so, Mike, uh, I know that uh, transportation is reimbursement from the state based on formula. We don't do as well because we're not completely regional. Do you see any possibility that the state might add relief in transportation based on inflation? Sorry, I chuckled because the governor's budget actually pretty significantly reduced regional transportation reimbursement. Jesus. Um, uh, I think it was to the order of 8% or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, and we would just be, it's, it's, it's not, it's based on a per mileage. It's not like based on one district gets more or less. It's not like circuit break or something like that. So that, I do hope that our colleagues in the legislature uh, will track that. And um, that's not the first time he's tried to reduce regional transportation. So he being the governor. Um, and oftentimes uh, representatives push back and at least get it back to being level. Um, but there's, there's a literal reduction in transportation, federal, regional transportation aid in the, in the governor's budget. Um, Peter. Yeah, just to follow up on that. So, um, so uh, first I'm, I'm here as a delegate from the Amherst School Committee, but just since the question of um, transportation came up. So that, so that's right, the, the, that line, that subject to appropriation line was significantly decreased in the governor's budget. And so this is a real emphasis point of advocacy that if y'all want to get involved in, please reach out to me. We've tried to do it every single year, but this is one of those things where regional school districts across the state band together and we try and generate pressure. But of course, we have this systemic structural problem that we're outgunned by the Boston reps right in the suburbs, and they just don't get why it's it's just to fully fund regional transportation they forget about the broken promise that you know back in the 50s when this when our region was constructed it was on one of the carrots one of the main financial carrots is that we're going to fund your regional transportation and they've never ever funded that fully and and it's it's never risen to the level of of, of a commitment um so that's an advocacy thing that happens every year, uh, you know, our local reps are totally on board with it, uh, but, you know, they are two voices among many. And so um, 
something we'll be putting some effort into it to the degree that we can from our small humble soapbox out here in Amherst. But if anybody really wants to get into that, please contact me. We can there's Facebook groups and you know organizations and 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 there will be budget amendments that will need to be you know advocated for and whatnot. So something that that you can spend some time on if you if you have it. Um, Sean. Thanks, Lynn, and thanks, Mike, for letting us get a word in. Um, so, <laughs> um, rural school aid, Mike, it looks, I think we're going in like year three of rural school aid. Um, I know it's not a huge, huge amount, but I, I don't know the answer to this. I mean, when, when do you think you, you'll get a comfort level that it's something that's reliable and ongoing and um, could potentially be budgeted? If you haven't budgeted for it yet, I don't know if you guys have incorporated that in. Um, I know it's it's new, so it's um, always a little precarious. Doug, given given your response, I'll let Doug answer that one. Sean, <laughs> yeah. Um, <clears throat> so we get that rural aid um, only at the region, not for Amherst. Um, it has varied in its size, and so that's part of you know the the concern I have for you know strictly budgeting for it. Um, so it tends to kind of be I don't want to say found money, but it 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 provides some relief in that regard. Um, but if, if it becomes, I think, over the next couple of years, you know, more consistently funded, uh, then it'll be a lot easier to sort of predict what that what that uh, size is. Uh, in the current year, it's about 90,000, but it's been 65,000. So, you know, you don't want to, um, I just don't think it's been consistent enough yet to, to budget. But I think in the next couple of years, if they continue to sort of fund that line in the budget, then, then we'll be able to be more uh, programmatic in how we do it. Peter? Yeah, just real quick. So that line originates from Senator Adam Hines. He's the senator, state senator from Berkshires. Um, he's only, and he's currently running for lieutenant governor. I'm not telling you who to vote for, but you know the reality of all this advocacy is that politics matter. You know, a big reason why a lot of these things haven't been funded is because who's been in the governor's office in the last X number of years. You know, so um, you know, pay attention because whoever wins governor and lieutenant governor will have a major impact on how our school and town line items are funded over the next several years. By the way, Adam Hines now lives in Amherst, um, just to be clear. Um, so um, I do have one other question going back to ESSER funds. You said you're on the third round, the multi-year. This um, It's slated to end in September 2024. Are you thinking they're going to add more funds or you just want to stretch existing funds out? I'm sure that they would love, my professional organization would love more funds, but that the request was not actually around use, uh, adding more funds. It was around stretching the use so that it could cover multiple budget years more than it currently does. Okay. Any other questions of the schools? Then let's move to the library. Um, Sharon, uh, Austin. Oh, I'm sorry, Paul. Sonia has to leave for another, because we thought this meeting was going to be over earlier, but um, so is there anything you want to say before you have to leave, Sonia, just so we don't lose your wisdom? You're muted, though. No, I'm sure you and Sean have it covered. Thanks, Sonia. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Thank you. Appreciate your coming to join us today. Um, okay, we're going to library. Okay, well, Mike, I always enjoy your presentations. I don't think you're long-winded at all. <laughs> um, so, so COVID for the library, um, we're having the same problems that the schools do with staff shortages. Um, uh, yeah, uh, you know, their staff are getting it um, during their family get-togethers and, um, yeah. Thankfully, we don't have to, gosh, worry about the psychological issues and and well-being of our patrons the way that the schools have to do with the kiddos i'm you know my heart breaks for uh this whole many generations of, the, of these children that they've been through these past couple of years. Um, regarding our patrons, our biggest problem is mask noncompliance. Uh, for the most part, 
patrons get it. They're on board. This is Amherst. They're educated. Yay. But the other day we had somebody come in with a, I'm an, a proud anti-vaxxer uh, jacket on and he refused to wear a mask. And, and that's really hard on staff. And, you know, we don't want to call the police. We don't want to make things worse. Um, you know, do we serve them? But that just encourages them that it's okay. Do we escort them out? Which of course is just going <gasps> to... Anyways, um, so that's that's COVID for us. The next few years are kind of going to be weird for the libraries um, because we have the North Amherst Library Building Project going on. Uh, well, that will go on soon. And then the Jones Building Project. So uh, we will be for the North Amherst Library Project. We're going to move North Amherst services down to the Munson, um, increase open hours. That's where the staffing will be. Um, computers, materials, and all of that. So that's great. And then when the North Amherst bu uh, building project is done, we'll move them out. And then the Jones project will begin um, several months later and, and we will move all of the Jones stuff out. We'll be able to increase the, the hours at both branches. Staffing will, will go there, materials, collections, programming, uh, that. And, and we will also be uh, looking for other interim locations. Um, we, I, I love what Mike, what you said about, you know, operational efficiencies once once uh, the Jones project uh, especially is done, you know, not only staffing efficiencies, you know, better sight lines, that kind of thing, but the utilities. Um, so we're expecting savings there. Uh, so we're really excited about that. Um, financially speaking, where the, the library is is for FY23 going to be where we always are. So the town appropriation covers most of the library salaries. It only pays for salaries, um, but it doesn't cover 100% of our salaries. So we're going to be in the whole let's say 60 grand, 70 grand. Uh, I'm, uh, it very much depends on the COLAs, you know, union negotiations, those health insurance increases. So until I get that information, I'm kind of, I'm kind of up a creek. I can't, um, my whole budget is around, you know, those figures. So in, until I, until I get those numbers, I, I can't give anybody anything concrete, but that's, that's pretty much where we are now. I beat you, Mike. <laughs> Thank you. By, by a serious amount, but <laughs> um, that's okay. Um, are there questions for the library? Austin. So this is a question from the library, not for the library. Mm -hmm. And um, it's one that is raised all the time. I just want to raise it again. And that is, um, is there a prospect in our lifetime that the town and the library will reach a new understanding about the contribution of the town to the salaries of people at the library. Anybody want to try to answer that? Yeah, so I will. Um, okay, Paul. Usually, Sonia, Sonia usually likes to answer this one. Um, <laughs> right, Sharon? Um, yeah, I mean, right now, unless there is a realignment of the budget, there aren't, you know, you're looking at the numbers that we're looking at. And unless there's a new influx of cash or anything, I think that relationship is sort of stable. And I understand the point that the library makes, but, um, but I don't see that uh, changing in the near future, at least. So I'm raising it as a, not for, uh, you know, when you said the near future, I, I just think that we need to get involved in a long term in a conversation about how to deal with this problem over the long term mm -hmm. because it and and the failure to deal with it year after year puts the life i mean again we're all on the same team but puts the library in a very difficult pos position mm -hmm. uh, so i'm just asking that the you know the numbers don't work out which is i get it that we think together about how to think about this uh, over the over the long term, rather than just saying, you know, every year the same thing, which is the numbers don't don't work out, which I understand. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. since we are a budget coordinating group, I think it's appropriate that we together think about this as a long term problem for the town, and not just say it's a library problem. Mm -hmm. By the way, that was a good speech. Okay. 
Any other questions for the library? Then I'm moving on to the town and I assume this is Paul and Sean. Yeah, so I'll start. Um, much of what um, what Mike said and Sharon say, I just sort of add on to we all going through the same things. Um, you know, pandemic uh, increased workload uh, for many for many of us because we had to reconfigure everything. Uh, as finance, I just want to shout out to that department um, with Sean and Sonia in particular. Um, you know, they they have major new grant programs that they've had to manage. CARES grant program now the ARPA program. Uh, these are huge um, management challenges because there are not just it's, it's understanding the rules, and then there's also the whole reporting piece of it which is really intense uh, because we have to document everything every time you know you see all these money coming in but we have to document everything and get our departments who are spending the money to make sure they're doing everything properly so big piece of that dpw police and fire public safety 24 7 uh their works hasn't changed that much i mean it, it's gone up and down um we are experiencing the same kind of the great resignation is real um, we're seeing a lot of turnover um, people choosing to retire earlier or at, at a certain point, um, put a, there's a, the HR department is handling a lot of work at different levels uh, along the same lines in terms of where we stand. Our major budget driver is our, our, our people. And that means collective bargaining. We are in arbitration with our fire department, firefighters union right now. We have uh, all the other unions for, for other unions are up for negotiation right now. Uh, and for those who are for, and, and, and the climate has changed in terms of what the, with the pressure on wages right now is really becoming more apparent as we start to go into these negotiations. Um, recruitment is also a challenge because uh, especially as we're working to diversify our staff, um, it's, it's, we, you know, we're, people are bringing us competing proposals, um, especially in certain professions like wastewater, uh, any kind of licensed profession, people can, can, you can just see the market, what's going on with those jobs. And it's really, it's, we're so working through that. The big um, thing for us, I mean, as we go through our budget, everything, you know, the council has established two major lenses that they want us to look at everything th through, and that is through racial equity and through sustainability, and that we are trying to incorporate that into all of our decision making. Um, the council approved the uh, establishment of two new departments, which is the major um, driver in our budget uh, for the coming years, which is a, a DEI um, uh, department, which includes two people, and then the CREST program, uh, which we're still in the implementation phases of. We've been very successful at getting grants for these for this program, but it, the long term impact is will will be long term. Um, it's a big it's a big big new program, and that's why you see that um, the funding the way it is. And in terms of the other things, economic development high priority for the town, and then the other thing that's going to change. Um, that we don't really know yet, but it, it, we all know it's going to be different is that our little sort of health department of one and a half people with a, is not gonna look like that going future in the future. We know that you know, public health has a much higher profile now and needs more investment to move that forward. We are having regional talks about how to look at health, not on a town by town basis, but on a region by region basis. That's the only way to really attract this, the quality and the level of staff that we expect while maintaining our own sort of um, uh, authority over what we need to do in our community. So Sean, what would you like to add? Sean, Sean's good. Are there questions about the town's issues, budget? Peter. So, Paul, did I understand you correctly? So for the for the first years of Crest, you're funding that operational line with, with one-time grants that you don't expect to be there in the future. Is that correct? No. Sean. No, so um so the operational side of Crest is we're trying to incorporate into our 2.5% increase that you know part of that will go towards that. And then that's the re reason why we're asking for the additional three hundred thousand. There are some things that we view as one-time costs um, related to Crest, uh, vehicle, I mean, sort of one-time costs, vehicle purchases, outfitting space, um, 
depending on how software works, the, the, the software is super expensive um, training and, and legal support to kind of get things up and running because, you know, this is very novel. Um, and, and so so those types of things were funding out of the grant. Um, but the operating costs in terms of the responders, the director, the, um, and the, the other position, um, we're trying to fold those into the existing operating budget or the proposed operating budget. Okay. Are there other questions about the town budget? Okay, seeing none, I think the, uh, I wanna make sure we cover two things before we finish. And I know we're pushing up against time limits. We probably exceed them. Uh, one is um, if we need a second meeting and when we think it would be best, we'll poll for it. We won't try to come up with a date today. Uh, but there might be um, some need based on whatever we find out about insurance or other things as we move along. And the second thing is I want to make sure we designate somebody who will approve the minutes on case we do not meet a second time because I don't want to have to meet just to approve minutes to approve minutes. So uh, with that, Sean, you were going to do the calendar. Sure. All right, so um, I won't go through all the dates, but I sent this out to everybody. Um, and I guess it's mostly if there's any questions or if anything people saw that jumped out, uh, the upcoming important dates um, around CPA and capital are the things that are coming up in the near future with um, the presentation of the CPA recommendation uh, to finance committee and then JCPC starting up pretty soon. Um, we have the, I guess the second page here is probably the easiest to look at which is splitting it by type of budget. So um, for operating budgets, like always, the, the library and the school's budgets are due by the end of March so that um, the town manager can then incorporate them into his budget uh, proposal to the council. Um, and then we've got the presentation to the council, all the, you know, the month of May is always very busy with finance committee and reviewing um, the budget. And then um, there will be, Council will have at least a couple of meetings likely to, to decide what they're going to do with the budget. On the capital side, we start JCPC in a couple of weeks. Um, that will, they'll provide a recommendation to the town manager by the end of, um, we try to do that by the end of March. Um, so the town manager has the month of April to finalize uh, his capital improvement program, which will then go to the council again by, um, by the, the first business day in May. Um, finance committee will review that. And then same thing, council will have a couple meetings to discuss. CPA, we don't, um, this timeline is probably gonna modify a little, change a little bit. This is sort of a, a rough guesstimate at this point. We know finance committee is gonna discuss it on the 8th of February. Not sure if they will be able to make a recommendation at that point or not. Uh, so, so that could be, there could be another meeting from finance committee. Uh, we tentatively have it with at the town council on the 21st. In the past, CPA went along the same path as the operating budget, but because we moved CPA up early in the, earlier in the year um, so that we knew what they were going to recommend by the time we got to our, our capital planning or our capital improvement program, there's, there's been some requests to get the CPA recommendation voted sooner um, so that people don't do the recommendation in December and then have to wait till June to find out if it's approved. Um, so tentatively for the 21st, but that could change. And then the regional schools, you know, we'll certainly look for input from Doug and Mike on, um, on timing of when the other four town meeting or when the other town meetings are, um, but their budget come at the end of March. Uh, we would have, we usually will do an early, earlier timeline for the regional school so that their budget can be approved around the same time as the other towns. Um, so there would be a presentation to the council sometime in April, um, at least a couple of finance committee meetings, finance committee meetings to review and, and make a recommendation. And then it would go back to the council um, Sometime it could be the 16th. It could be the meeting before that um, as well, if, if uh, the council decides to bring it up earlier to vote. And that's the timeline. Are there questions or clarifications on the budget timeline? I just, hey, Sean, I just have one question. When do you think, uh, I know union negotiations aren't going to be settled. I don't know when you're going to get the health insurance numbers, but when do you think the town will be able to get out to us our salary projections? So we are going to try to do that pretty soon, actually. We're going to try to do that in the next couple of weeks. Awesome. Um, we get, it's going to have an estimate 
but we're going to try to do that. I, Holly and Sonia and I are going to sit down next week and go person by person through the salary projections. Um, and then, as you said, it'll have an estimate for the outcome of, um, of negotiations, but we should have that up to you within a couple of weeks. Cause yeah, That's, I know you got, you need it to. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, any other questions about timeline or things that relate to timeline, like Sharon just asked. Okay, then let's take this down and ask if there are any other general questions or comments that people would like to make. I'd like to start out by saying I have found this very useful. It's delightful to be in a civilized conversation with each other <laughs> about where we're all coming from and what we are all uh, facing. And I hope that in the future, we might even think about doing something like this um, routinely, not just when we think there's a problem. So um, are there any other comments or questions in general? Yes, Paul. So you had asked about a minutes and I would, maybe I would suggest that the chair and vice chair approve the minutes, the committee I'll delegate to the chair and vice chair to give Is, approval of the minutes. Do I need a vote on that? I think if everybody nods their head, I think you'll be fine. Everybody give me a thumbs up. Yes. Okay. Got it. Great. We're, Allison and I will take care of that. Um, and Paul or Doug or Sean or Mike or uh, Andy, with all of your experience, do you see something that will come forward that could bring us the need to meet again. Mike. Um, I think, you know, the thing that is really for you, Lynn, and the council and perhaps FinCom is that, you know, I don't know if there's going to be a need after the four town meeting, the next four town meeting, when we get a little more clarity, perhaps on, you know, you'll get more clarity from Doug and myself of where we're sitting, uh, but also the other towns, I can't predict to Shootsbury how you're gonna react. I can't predict to you how Shootsbury is gonna react or Pelham or Leverett. Um, that obviously has implications. The nature of regional districts, other than being the bane of superintendent business managers existence is that they're, they don't fit well with, you know, not to exceed or not to be below, however you want to frame it, because it's a relational uh, assessment method, a relational assessment that changes year to year. And in this district, the method changes year to year. We haven't had the same method for years on end. So that whether you want to handle that through the full council, through the fin finance committee, through this group, that from the school's perspective, that's probably the, the big uh, the reason that I could see coming back together and maybe the goal would be that, that folks hear where the reality is, but, you know, I can't speak for the library. I can't speak for you all in this group from the town side of whether that this is the right group or a different forum is the right one. But that's, that's probably the most volatile thing on the school side is, is relates to where we are getting four towns to agree on an assessment method and a budget level. Okay. Andy. It, uh, based upon my experience with prior budget coordinating group, I think that the uh, major reason that we would need to reconvene is if there is a factual change in projections that we didn't anticipate and need to adjust to. Um, given what the situation is currently in the state budgeting process, um, I think that it really depends upon um, what happens within the House and Senate, whether they reach any consensus amounts early about um, state aid to um, schools and uh, localities, uh, municipalities, or whether we have to wait until um, we see something out of the House Ways and Means Committee in April. Uh, but um, that would be the biggest um, driver that might change at this point that I can see. I don't know if anybody else's thoughts on it. And I guess the only other one I've picked up from conversations with Paul was the insurance. And just not knowing that one. Andy, you have another comment? No. Are there other comments? Yes, Peter. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess I would just note that um, Process-wise, the Amherst School Committee has 
hasn't had an initial budget presentation from um, superintendent and our finance director yet. That's that's coming very soon. Um, so at, as of right now, we, we don't know if two and a half percent is going to be able to cover our budget without cuts. Um, we also haven't had a discussion, um, a full discussion on the Emmer School Committee since since the election or since the newly elected members took over, um, came on. Um, about what people's feelings are in terms of budget level. Um, so that could be another variable that affects um, uh, the, the items here. But so, I mean, I'm not offering an opinion one way or another about what mm -hmm. it should be, but I just, um, if you just, if you just check marking, you know, unknown variables that could change, I would probably put that one on the list. Thank you. Are there others that anybody wants to raise? Are there any other comments? Seeing none, then I want to just note we do not have anybody in the audience. And and so therefore, we do not have any public comment. We would have public comment if we had somebody in the audience. Allison. Yeah, I was just uh, sort of picking up on um, your your comment earlier about um, making this more regular, which might also connect with Austin's comment about sort of thinking long longer term as well, and just sort of wonder about setting up a meeting um, of this group and, and, and thinking about that, um, when when should it convene, right? We were thinking about just this particular FY23 budget year, um, whether we might need to meet again. And I think there's opportunity for us to talk about and think about um, bringing this group together at another point to have those conversations um, on, on sort of, as you said, a more regular basis. And what does that look like? And what is sort of the charge of this group? Mm -hmm. Okay, any other comments? Then seeing none, I'm going to adjourn the meeting at 9.45. Thank you, everybody. Absolutely, thanks.